All right. Welcome back, everybody, to the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens. This is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. Um, and the theme for tonight's conversation about the Dharma. Tonight's topic is going to be Akasha space. <laughs> so um, this is an idea that has come up a lot. It comes up often in conversations about Buddhism. It sort of comes up more, I think, in the realm of meditation, but it is definitely a very philosophical, uh, it, it's a dharma, it's a dharmic idea in that way. So I wanted to talk about it. it. It also pertains to our sutra that we've been reading. It's it's an idea that's going to come up in the, in the sutra, so I wanted to talk about it. So, um, yeah, I don't think I've ever kind of devoted an entire evening or session just to this idea. But like I said, it, it comes up a lot. So I thought we would talk just about this one idea. So the first thing that we want to know about Akasha, space. The first thing we want to know is that we are not talking about outer space. <laughs> we are not talking about up there space. And we're not really talking about the black void of space, meaning like, you know, the, the up, up there-ness. Space, we're just talking about, well, it's a, it's, it's a dimension of reality in that way. It's just about, well, the space between things, you know, the space. <laughs> we're going to talk about that idea. So the first thing I want to mention about the idea of space is that it is a very old idea. And so way before the Buddha, people in India were talking about space. But also the idea of space is a, it's an old, old, old idea. So I want to talk a little bit about what it sort of what it means in general has always meant in general and then we'll start getting into what it means specifically within the world of buddhism and then specifically the world of the type of buddhism that we're talking about so when i say that this is a really old idea you know basically you know the the greeks and even the pre-socratic philosophers they talked about space Again, in India, the philosophers talked about space. It's just one of those ideas that it used to be much more a part of the conversation and it sort of died out in that way. It's not a part of the conversation. I'm, I might have a few things to say about why that is, but let's get to it. When we're talking about the realm of space or this idea of space, it is sometimes referred to as the fifth element. Now, I probably shouldn't have even said that because I don't want you thinking of it as something, even as an element. But the reason why it is often called the fifth element is because of those four great elements. So we also talk a lot about the four great elements, earth, water, fire, and air, or wind, the, the fourth one, air or wind. And, you know, basically what we're talking about is in a very old framework for thinking about the physical world. So in understanding this world that we live in, even understanding this physical body, all things physical can be understood as amalgamations of the four great elements in varying degrees. And I often, everybody here has probably already heard this a million times, but it's important to keep in mind that the earth element is about being solid and things can be in varying degrees of solidity. So things can be almost paper thin, as we say, and you can see through them. 
or they could be thicker or very thick and so thick and dense that they get so heavy in that way. So density has to do with the earth element. Weight has to do with the earth element. Solidity. The water element is about fluidity, about liquid, about things flowing. Things in a state of matter in which they flow. So that's earth and water. And then there's that fire element. And as I often like to point out, fire is about temperature. Everything has a temperature. And you could dis distinguish this from that because this might have a different temperature than that. So fire is about things having a temperature. And again, all things have it, even though it might be a low temperature. And then the fourth element is about things moving or not. So that element of air, which is better understood as wind, it has to do with things being self-moving or not. <laughs> so I often point out that like a rock, a rock doesn't move. It just sits there. So it basically doesn't have any wind element. If you touch a rock, it's cold. That's very low on the fire element. There might be trace amounts of liquid in a rock, but it is predominantly earth element. And then depending on where that rock falls in the periodic table of elements, it'll tell you exactly how dense the earth element is. Whereas I am moving, so I'm I got wind element, 98.6 degrees on the fire element, and I'm a combination of liquid flowing through veins and phlegm and saliva, and then the bones and everything made of the earth element. And of course, earth and water combine to make tissues and all kinds of other things. So the four elements are about anything that kind of exists. Now, if I had a rock, and I used to have I used to have a rock around here. So I don't have a rock, but let's imagine that my fist is a rock for the moment. The rock, again, no wind element, low fire element, no water element, high on the earth element. Michael, wind element, fire element, water element, earth element. The the space that we're talking about tonight is this, the, the separation, the, the, the room between me and the rock that, that you do not think I am the rock, that you separate us. Well, the space element is the element that is between us. But the most important thing for tonight is that we don't want to be thinking about space as something, because the four elements are about things. Space is in between all the things. And we need to go a little deeper to really understand what space is all about. So I want to use one of my optical illusions. This is a great one for talking about space, but I'm going to use it for a specific reason. So in this scenario, and by the way, let's remember for, for now, let's try to pretend that I'm not holding up a little piece of paper with images on it. Let's really pretend that you know, that you think I'm either holding a, a goblet cup thing or that there are two faces. The idea is, is that for these to be perceived as two different things, meaning one face and another face, it needs, you, you need space. Because 
if there were no space between these two, they would be one face. They would be the same face. But because there is space, there is two. Now, if you are perceiving the, the black goblet or candlestick or whatever, then this is space. And the point is, is that if this and this and this and this, if all of this wasn't space, then the cup or the candlestick would extend out <laughs> infinitely forever. So your, your mind, in order to discern and perceive the one object, you need the space around it. Ah, so right there, we want to notice that there's this relationship between something and then space. And what I want you to be thinking about is that it is the space that is allowing for there to be the object. So we want space to have a, a sense of allowance. And, and why I want what why I would like you to think about space as allowing or allowance is so that we don't think of it as something, but we think about it more as a, a potential maker in that way. Tanya, I saw you had you had an idea. Yeah, it, it occurred to me, I mean, because it seems like it's something that happens during perception, right? And so you could have space not only with visually, but you could have it with all the senses, right? You you're reading my notes. You read oh, okay. <laughs> no, no. No, you set I, me up really well. <laughs> no, you yeah, yeah. Exactly. Okay. So I'm I'm laying a little breadcrumb trail here. And you're, pick, you're picking up on my breadcrumb trail. And so that's great. So the first thing that I wanted to point out using this example was about the relationship between form, as it would be called, an object, and then the space <clears throat> that is going to allow for that object. Now, exactly, Tanya, you literally took the words out of my mouth of where this was going. Now I want to make sure that we know that this is not just happening at a visual level. And what that means is, is that you take, the, like, for example, the auditory level. And the auditory level is happening, the same thing is happening. And what that is, is, is that you can think of so there's the auditory phenomena, but there's a way in which the mind, in order to perceive that it was a clap from my hands, the idea is, is that there's, there needs to be space perceived that is not the clapping sound. So in other words, <clears throat> sorry, the idea is, one sec. So the idea is, is that if, if, um, if there was a little cat, for example, meowing, meow, at the same time that I was clapping, your perception at an auditory level would separate the two sounds and say, that's the sound of a cat, that's the sound of two hands clapping. And that would be the space at an auditory level. <clears throat> and the same thing happens at the level for smell in terms of isolating a smell as coming from something specific. There needs to be this dimension of space around it in a way. Same with eating flavors in that sense. If I put a uh, ro Rocky Road, so if I had Rocky Road ice cream, right, 
in one sense, it's all just the ice cream. But then with the rocky road, I could taste the nuts, the marshmallows, and the other parts. And then at a taste level, I could be separating that. And there would need to be, this is getting subtle, but a kind of olfactory or gustatory space between the different elements of a what have you. Even somebody, you know, a wine taster who's saying, oh, I, I, I smell a little bit of this, I taste a little bit of that. Th that's creating space in what would otherwise be a monolithic taste in that sense. Now, Tanya, that makes sense about the other senses. Now there's something even more interesting. So <clears throat> not only is space a dimension of vision and hearing and so on, but there's an even more interesting level of space. And what that is, is <clears throat> it's about the space between yesterday and today. And there's a very kind of famous saying, and I think it comes from the world of physics, but there's this saying that if it weren't for time, everything would be happening all at the same time. But it is because there is space between yesterday and today that allows, there's that word again, it allows for there to be yesterday and then the space of a year. And now we get a year ago and the space of a decade and the space of a century. So time and what I want you to be thinking about right now, and it's not actually that different, which is what's really wild. To separate this face from this face using the space so as that there is face A and face B, in order for there to be day one and day two, in order for there to be two different days and not just one 48 hour mega day. <laughs> there needs to be space between those two days. And so we notice that space is allowing for time as well. So space is truly a, a, a different dimension in that way. But what is that dimension? So this is where I want to come back quickly to this example. So like I've been saying, the most important thing about space is you, that you don't turn it into anything. And I'm going to give you an easy way to now not do that. What I want you to think about is Think about if there were, if I invited one of you over to, over to this side and you came over here and we were both looking at this, except you were seeing two faces and I was seeing the glass. What I want you to notice is that your dimension of space and my dimension of space are two different spatial dimensions. Even though we're looking at the same thing, my space is your space. And what I'm pointing at right now is that space is a dimension of conceptualization. It's a dimension of the mind's ability to think about anything because like time, that if there wasn't space, it would all be happening at once. If there wasn't space between all of these objects, your mind would collapse them into one monolithic object. <laughs> but because of the space, your mind gets to say, oh, no, 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 that's a bird, that's a flower, that's the tree, those are words, 
that's a screen, that's Michael. So space is what is allowing the mind to discriminate. Space is what is allowing the mind to kind of perceive of differentiated objects. And again, what I want you to then realize by my example here is that your space isn't my space. So now not only is space not something physical, but it's also not something that's out there at all. It's not out. Not only is it not up there, it's not out there. So we realize, oh, oh, by the way, too, I've, I have just shifted into the Buddhist understanding of space. So the Buddhists get really, really into the idea of space. And so what the Buddhists do with it. So the Buddhists in the earliest tradition, they are really interested in what, I, what we've been talking about, space. And the idea is, is that, and I should have said this a little bit before, but not too late. So I mentioned that space is a topic that you hear about a lot within the realm of meditation, not physics and, and uh, philosophy exactly, but more about meditation. And one of the reasons that is, is if you haven't heard about this, I, most of you that I know here have heard about this a lot from me, but, you know, the Buddhists are really into talking about the three realms, what they call the realm of desire, the kamadhatu, what they call the realm of form, the rupadhatu, and what they call the formless realm, the arupadhatu, no rupa, no form. And the basic idea of those three realms of reality is that there's sort of a way in which each of us is projecting out onto the world ideas like, well, things like beautiful and ugly, but also things like, you know, useful. But what is useful is useful to me. So a subjective realm of value, use, aesthetics. Uh, they call it the realm of desire because it's about things being desirable in that way. Like, ooh, give me that. Ooh, give me that. And of course, what you desire is different from what I desire. So I've got my kamadatu that I'm projecting out onto the world, and you've got your kamadatu that you're projecting out onto the world. But in the old school form of Buddhism, the idea was that you could calm your mind down. Actually, this is the idea of all forms of Buddhism. You can calm your mind down and realize what you're doing with that projecting. You could remember, oh yeah, what I think is beautiful is not objectively beautiful, is not beautiful for everyone. And if you could rein in the judgment, if you could rein in the projecting of desire, then you would get into what is called a jhana or a dhyana, a dhyanic state. And you would be in the realm of just form meaning just seeing things in terms of solidity, liquidity, temperature, and movement. Is it moving? What temperature is it? Is it solid? Is it liquid? So a very, very neutral, equal level in which things are understood simply at an elemental level. That's the realm of form. It's very relaxing there because it's not full of the psychodrama. And that's the realm of pure form. Those are that's a jhana. And there's four levels. We know there's these four jhanic levels or four dhyanas. All of those are in the realm of just form. But basically, we're getting more and more neutral in regards to that form. And by neutral, I'm talking about being emotionally 
worked up or excited in any way, shape, or form about phenomena. And then what the Buddhists talk about is that there is a way to then transcend the realm of form. And the way that you do that is by attending to, abiding upon, meditating upon space. Now, let me give you an example, and I'm not suggesting that you do this as a meditation right now. I'm just giving you a quick example. So the idea here is, is you know, this is, this is one of my uh, kind of a Buddhist riddle. <laughs> How many? Right? And the idea, when I ask you how many, it's sort of like, well, you got to tell me, you got to tell me a little more, right? Because if I asked how many hands, it would be two. But if I said, how many fingers, it would be 10. And the idea here is, is that when I ask you how many, your mind wants to know, okay, well, what's space and what's sought? Like, what is the form and what is space? And the idea is, is that if we're talking about hands, then of course the space is <laughs> this space in between here. And, and here, there's no space, meaning it's all just hand, <laughs> hand, hand. So the space is here. But if I start talking about fingers, now all of a sudden this space and even this space start to come into play. But wait a minute, where was that space a minute ago when I was just talking about the two hands? And my point is, is that you could meditate on the form, meaning on the hands, on the object, on the thing. But the idea is, is that upon meditating upon form, you could begin to abide on the space, not the form. And what I've been kind of actually been trying to point at when I keep saying that space is a dimension of perception and conceiving, what I want to get at is that there's an, there's an infinite amount of space here. It just depends upon what your mind is focusing on. And so, in a way, by not attending to abiding upon or meditating upon the form but attending to the space, the spatial dimension, which is why I wanted you to think about allowance, because you would actually be meditating upon the sense of allowance. Because if you started to meditate on an actual area, like a zone that you were calling space, that wouldn't be space. <laughs> that would be a delineated, a delineated area. Space is actually space in that way. And so the idea is, is that if you could, or if one does, move out of attending to just form and moves to just attending to the space, you could move into then what is called a formless samadhi which is a formless realm and that's that third arupadhatu the realm of what is called the realm of infinite space it's just the space <laughs> again no solid objects of form in that way now there's further to go there are four levels of formlessness. The entry point, the entryway, the gateway to the formless realm is space, is this idea of akasha that we've been talking about now for about a half an hour. That idea of akasha is the gateway to the formless realm. But the idea then is that 
there is a, a mind, an intellect, let's call it a consciousness, that is attending to the realm of infinite space. There is a consciousness that is, and if you kind of follow my uh, demonstration here, there is a consciousness that used to be differentiating objects. Actually, there used to be a consciousness that was not only differentiating objects, it was privileging and favoring some objects over other objects. It was judging these different objects. That was in the realm of desire. This consciousness that was privileging different objects begins to just abide on the objects without the psychodrama. Then that consciousness slips into the abiding to the space, not the object. But then even that space is a focus for that consciousness. And so the second formless samadhi is when space is removed as in concept. And then there is only that original discriminating consciousness. I want to make it clear that as far as I understand this second formless samadhi that is called the samadhi of infinite consciousness, this is not consciousness being aware of consciousness. It is actually, the idea is, is that when the space ayatana, it's called a, an ayatana, a base or a foundation of awareness, when the space ayatana is removed, that consciousness that was thinking about the space, that was thinking about objects, that was doing all of that, that consciousness no longer has anything to think about. And so there is only that objectless consciousness, which I have read as being described as a residual hum of consciousness. It's not actually actively karmically thinking. It's a kind of just like when you, um, when you stare at a light, and you close your eyes and you can still see it, or you get like tracers, it's like tr consciousness tracers. And the idea is, is that then if you can hang out in the second formless samadhi and allow that residual hum of objectless consciousness to subside, you enter the third formless samadhi, which is called akinkanya nothingness, nothing thereness, ah, kim kanya, no, just nothing thereness. And the reason why I wanted to walk us through this, by the way, is I wanted to basically bring up the fact that Buddhism has all of these very subtle different words. A word like space, which is different than nothingness. And the reason why space isn't nothingness is because space is still relative to objective forms. So there's a way in which space is always at working at, in play with objective form. But if you were really without space or form, then there's this idea of absolute nothingness, and that's that third formless realm. The fourth formless realm is called the realm of neither perception nor non-perception, and appears to be a kind of non-dual state of a kind of awareness, but it is not subject-object awareness. I'll leave it at that. I don't think I've ever been in the realm of perception or non-perception, so let's just kind of keep it at that. Regardless, though, what I kind of wanted to, to bring up tonight as a kind of segue into our sutra, I wanted to bring up that in the early Buddhist tradition, 
space was very related to meditation. It was, it was, it was very much about like, what is disturbing the mind? What is getting the mind all worked up and frazzled? And the idea was, oh, it's object objects, it's stuff. And so there was a way in which like the sweet spot of consciousness was in the space. It was the least like ah, the, the least anxiety producing in that way. And in the early Buddhist tradition, and this goes kind of segues into the later Mahayana tradition that we're going to talk about, what the tradition starts to describe, and now again, this is more of a Mahayana idea, although you do see it in the early tradition, they will start to talk about a space body. One, and you know, we've kind of talked about bodies in the past in that way, meditative bodies. But the idea is, is that there is a way to come to inhabit a space body. And, you know, an idea or a shortcut to that, and, and that's not really what tonight is about, so I don't want to spend too long on it. But an idea or a way to think about that is It, it has to do with this, it's, it, you know, I, I do this almost every Sunday night. Every Sunday night, at some point, I feel like we go searching for the self. And we, and I present the idea to you, this idea of like, you know, where, where are you? And what I mean by that is, is like, between the ears and behind the eyes, or if I say that, do you say, I am here? Meaning I'm here. I'm, I'm not here. I'm not over here. I'm not over here. I'm here. And when we say that, I'm here, and by which I mean, I am the body. We are identifying as and with the physical body. But as I often like to point out, if, if you, by some unfortunate circumstance, were to lose a hand, you would say, I lost my hand. Well, that sounds like you aren't the hand, that the hand is one thing and you are another thing. because. You don't have that hand anymore, but you still are talking about you, you being you, but now you without a hand. I assume that goes for the other hand too. I assume that goes for the feet. I assume it goes for legs, arms, torso, organ exchange. So it's not that you are the body. You say you have a body. So I'll ask again then, where are you? If you're not the body, which we just established that we don't believe we're actually the body because we say things like my hand, where are you? And that's where we start thinking, ah, I'm between the ears and behind the eyes. And then it's like, okay, well, where exactly? Like in the auditory canal? Are you in the optic nerve? Are you in the synapses and the neurons? And the idea here is at a certain point, we have to hold, throw up our hands and say, oh, I'm not anywhere. And that's a big step towards the space body, <laughs> frankly, to recognize that you are not anywhere in terms of objective form in that way. Now, what they'll talk about then is that if you are. Well, basically what I'm getting at is, is that the degree to which you are identifying with the physical body is the degree to which you are in habiting that physical body. Like 
the degree to which you are clinging, meaning identifying is the degree to which you are it. So then that space body is achieved by a process of not identifying as or with the physical body in that way. And ultimately, of course, not identifying as or with anything, anything. And to be in that state of mind is to, in a sense, inhabit a space body. Okay. So all of that sounding okay so far. Cool. So even, yeah, just because I want to uh, make sure to mention this, and I, if I get started on the sutra, I don't think I will. So I wanted to just bring up a quick idea. So I, I already mentioned three ideas, and I just want to add a fourth and then talk about them all together. So the ideas that I'm talking about are space, nothingness, formlessness, and we need to throw into the mix now the idea of emptiness. At first blush, as they say, those four words would seem to be synonymous, that those four would seem to be saying exactly the same thing, that to say that something is spacious or formless or not anything at all is to say that it's empty. And I got to tell you that from a kind of, you know, subtle philosophical level, these four ideas are very different, although they are related. So let's start sort of at the top of the list or, you know, randomly, it, it's appointed to be the top at random, but formlessness. Formlessness is going to be a blanket category that's going to include space and nothingness. I, I just pointed out how space has this relationship to form, whereas nothingness is actually off the charts, nothing at all. It would You couldn't even give it a name because then that would be something at least to go on. So nothingness is really nothingness. Space is, again, the allowance or the dimension between objects. But those two, they fall under the category of formless. And the basic idea of something being formless is that it is intangible. It, it is not something that can be seen, smelt, touched or actually even thought about to a certain degree. So formless just means outside of the bounds of form. And you have to keep in mind that the mind and everything works by form, discerning and discriminating form in that way. So those three ideas then, formlessness, space being the entry point to formlessness, and then nothingness, they're all kind of in a family of ideas. And it's important to keep in mind that all of those ideas are in relationship to form, by which we mean tangible, objective physicality, whether it sounds, smells, and so on. Emptiness, however, emptiness is something else altogether. And the so this has been a kind of a very long kind of introduction to a way of a, a way of getting to just how profound the heart sutra is and other pranyaparamita uh, sutras these mahayana buddhist sutras so one of the main messages of the pranyaparamita sutras is that form is emptiness. And that's actually supposed to be, and is, if you kind of get it, mind-blowing information. And my point is, is that, so if I use a cup, apologies for the repeated use of the cup, 
but I actually want to talk about how space, space is about that part in here, because it's the space between this side and this side, it's the space in here. And as the, the Tao Te Ching tells us, that famous Chinese Taoist poem, fired earth makes the cup, but it's the space that makes it useful. It's a great quote from the Tao Te Ching about the relationship between form and space. But the most important thing, or one of the most important things to know about emptiness is that emptiness is not this part. This part is space. This part is the vacuousness. Emptiness is this whole other idea. And it's about, we've talked about it in the past, but it's about any objectified thing by which we mean a single thing. You know, like a cup. So a cup is one idea. It's one, look, it's one object right? It's th this is clearly just one thing, right? Is it really just one thing? Because this part and this part, I don't know, I could make an argument that those are sort of two different things, especially because this actually has its own name. So what I'm getting at is, is that there is a presumption of a single object. In this case, it's the cup. It could be my hand. It could be a pencil, whatever it is. The idea of the one thing, that's what's empty. That's what actually doesn't exist out here actually doesn't exist at all and it's why we call it empty space is more real than emptiness in that sense if if that if that makes sense because the cup never existed it was always only just a delineated a delineation in that sense now the tricky thing about emptiness though is realizing that, oh, but wait, I'm objectifying everything into just one thing all the time. Like right now, I'm looking at my laptop. You know, the one object, you know, that one thing. But when I look at it, it's got all these keys if I looked inside, it's all these electronics and all these parts, and then there's the screen. So it's actually many, 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 many things. And the laptop is just that one, you know, the one thing. And there isn't just one thing. But again, the tricky part about emptiness is realizing, but wait, that goes for all the little parts too. If I think they're just one thing, that's empty too. And indeed, it's emptiness all the way down. So it's one reified object on top of another reified object on top of another reified object. And the point of origin of all of this is the reification of this object. And that creates all the other objects. So that subject-object relationship is the starting point of this reification of individuated objects when you will never find that one individual object anywhere. Okay, everybody okay with now emptiness? 
Okay, now we can get back to Manjushri and company. Last week, one sec. So last week, we finished a very, very beautiful section on what was called the single characteristic Dharma door. We're now moving to basically kind of the, the end of the sutra. Um, <clears throat> as usual, the main kind of two characters of this sutra are these two bodhisattvas. The main bodhisattva, Manjushri, whose sutra it is. This is the sutra that's all about Manjushri's Buddha land or their, their purified Buddha realm. And then there's been this other bodhisattva, a uh, thunderous voice or, or lion courage, thunderous voice bodhisattva. And the general kind of framework of the sutra is that the bodhisattva lion courage, thunderous voice is the, the student, the acolyte, has all the questions for Manjushri, and basically Manjushri has been dispensing the wisdom throughout the sutra. Every now and then the Buddha has chimed in. It's been full of a lot of miraculous events, a lot of twists and turns in the narrative. But after, well, first of all, all these bodhisattvas showed up from all over the universe. And then the Buddha gave the teaching on, or, or all the bodhisattvas gave the teaching on the single characteristic. And then we get to this part. So, oh, by the way, um, so there is, of course, our translation from the Tibetan from 84,000.read. If you're looking at that version, I'm about to start reading from uh, paragraph 1.299. We are actually, if you have the treasury of Mahayana sutras, we are actually back. So the single characteristic Dharmador section isn't in here, but this is where we are now is where the text picks back up. So if you have this book, I'm on page 183, the third paragraph from the top. And I also have uh, my translation from Chinese I've been working on. I've re... Uh, I've broken this sutra. It's the sutra is so long. It's really, really long, and it has all of these very, like, clear parts where this happens, then this happens, then that happens. So, at present, I'm breaking this sutra up into ten chapters. I've sort of identified these ten major movements. We're in the last of those. So chapter 10 of my translation, otherwise we're at those other places. And so, the, at that time, the Bodhisattva Lion Courage Thunderous Voice addressed the Buddha saying, World Honored One, how long will it be until this Manjushri attains Anuttara Samyak Sambuddhi? How long will that Buddha's lifespan be? The Buddha said, Good son, you should ask Manjushri yourself. Then lying courage, thunderous voice, Bodhisattva addressed Manjushri saying, How long until the venerable attains awakening? So this is very reminiscent, actually, of how this all started. So a long time ago, months ago now, as far as Dharma doors are concerned, this conversation started between the two bodhisattvas. And it all started because this bodhisattva, lion courage, thunderous voice, the bodhisattva wanted to know all about like these questions of like, basically, how long have you been a bodhisattva? And how much longer will you be a bodhisattva until you become a Buddha, att attain awakening? That's basically the, 
the lion courage, the bodhisattva. It, it's these questions about how long have you been practicing? How much longer are you going to practice? And when you're done practicing, what will your Buddha land be like? So these, these questions along those lines. So we've heard this before. We've been kind of around this territory. But let's hear Manjushri's answer this time. So to the question, how long will it be until the Venerable attains awakening or Bodhi? Manjushri says, good son. Uh, and I'll read from the Tibetan one. So from the Tibetan version, noble one, when the element space takes form, I will fully awaken to Buddhahood. <laughs> so that, that was my <laughs> long introduction, why we needed to fully understand space. Because I, what I kind of wanted to do this evening was I wanted to start us off way back in the ancient world where it was like the four great elements and space. And then I wanted to lead us to where space was more of a kind of a meditative mind state. And we were feeling pretty good about that as a meditative mind state. I really wanted to juxtapose space to form and make sure we understood, oh, no, no, space is this whole other thing, whereas form is this whole, is, is objective form. So I wanted to bring us all the way through all of that so we could really appreciate exactly how wild an answer this is. So when is Bodhisattva Manjushri going to attain, attain awakening? As soon as space takes form. Now, this is, you know, well, first of all, that is utterly paradoxical. Like that is the idea that it's supposed to be basically this is supposed to sound like a koan in that sense. And, and basically a line like this could very well become a koan in that way. So I just want you to know that that's where the Zen koan tradition kind of comes from. It comes from something like this. So what does Manjushri mean that he'll attain awakening? when the realm of space takes bodily form, right? For, again, it's an impossibility. It will never happen in that sense. So again, yeah, Tanya, please, what do you got? I just want to make, you said bodily form? Mm. It, Apologies. Okay. It, it, yeah. Is so, it just form? It's a good question. So in the Tibetan version, it's about the element of space taking on form. In our good old treasury of Mahayana sutras, it's about the realm of space becoming a physical body. And then in the Chinese, as far as I'm concerned, it does say a form body. It does say if or when the realm of space takes bodily form. That's when Manjushri will achieve awakening. <clears throat> now, I again, this is I've attempted to make this a, a well-crafted Dharma talk by planting all the appropriate seeds in that way. So there is a, there's a way in which this is not supposed to be like clear, especially from this. This is actually the beginning of the paragraph. We have, we have more to go. So I just want you to know that, that the, an, the answer here is supposed to be kind of a mind bender. And by that, I mean, on the one hand, on the one hand, you're supposed to be thinking, but space, by definition, could never be 
in form, in, be in bodily form. So Manjushri is saying something about the impossible or paradoxical nature of awakening. Or if you are kind of following what I was saying about the space body, which I did introduce that idea of the space body for a reason, if you were following me on that, then like, and I don't want to make this too trippy or sound too trippy, but it's about that idea that I was getting across, which is if, if I, <clears throat> I, rather than identifying with and as the physical body, but was in a sense more identified with this kind of infinite realm of space and thus have this kind of vast spacious awareness as body you could kind of start to think of that as space taking bodily form kind of again i'm just trying to give you a, like there's a way in which this line is supposed to work on us and like what, what how are we supposed to understand that yeah, Tanya. Well, I, I don't think this is what it means, but it, what it struck me is like never, right? <laughs> because yes. space is never going to be a body, right? Yes, and that is the way we should read it. Okay, that is so the that way, means he's yeah. never going to be awakened. Kind of, because awakening isn't something to attain. Yay! Right? Excellent, excellent. I see nodding. Yes. Excellent. <laughs> that is the that is the exact. That's what Bodhisattva Manjushri wants to tell the the young Bodhisattva that awakening is not something attained in that sense. So, so now that we've got our hands firmly around this, let's read the rest of the paragraph. And I probably will stop. But so, noble one. When the element of space takes on form, I will fully awaken to Buddhahood. When illusory beings fully awaken to Buddhahood, at that time, I too will fully awaken to Buddhahood. So that's the idea of like, when, when Mickey Mouse, when Mickey Mouse becomes awakened, I too will become awakened, <laughs> right? When, it, when an illusory made up imaginary people in that way, when the arhats who have exhausted all their defilements, when they fully awaken to Buddhahood, at that time I too will fully awaken to Buddhahood. That one, I don't trust the Tibetan translation on that one because the Chinese is pretty clear about what this one is supposed to mean. Let's see, where'd you go? So they have it as uh, the realm of space becoming a physical body. If a magically produced person could attain enlightenment, I could attain it. That's our illusory person. And then if this one says, if an undefiled arhat could be no other than supreme enlightenment, I could attain it. And then my version, if an arhat without outflows is awakening, then I will attain it. And so the, the Chinese has this weird language about a, an, an arhat without outflows or a fully kind of, what's the language? An undefiled arhat. If an undefiled arhat achieves awakening then i'll achieve awakening the basic idea you have to kind of understand your buddhology a little bit but an arhat being of that older school form of buddhism when they achieve the state of no more outflows they achieve that state of arhat but the idea is they then also cut themselves off from the bodhisattva path 
And it's a, it's a little uh, subtle, but the basic idea is, is that an arhat without defilements, with anashrava, no more outflows, the basic idea is, is that they don't care about anything anymore. They're, they're so emotionally still that their work is done. That is the idea. The, they even use that language that the work is done. And what the Bodhi, what the Mahayana says is, oh, that's too bad. That's too bad that you became an arhat because you cut yourself off from the great compassion that leads to bodhisattvahood and real awakening. So supreme unsurpassable awakening is unachievable by an arhat because they've cut off that great compassion. So what Manjushri is saying is, is when an arhat who's cut off all their outflows, when that is full awakening, which it isn't, then I will achieve full awakening. That one's kind of like a technical one in that sense where it's not as interesting as if Mickey Mouse were to achieve awakening. Tanya, then Noe, yep. Yeah. It's the, the way that you describe it almost sounds a little bit like a Pratekya Buddha. Sort, I mean, the Arhat, but it's but it, but Pratekya Buddhas are more like Mahayana, right? Yeah, and actually, the way I described it, um, the difference between an Arhat is they learn how to cut off all their outflows and and reach that point of being careless or without care, <laughs> without compassion. Whereas a solitary Buddha figures that out all by themselves. Oh, because they haven't been part of a monastery. They're, they okay. are a solitary awakened one because they've figured it all out by themselves. And then they move into a state of being kind of emotionless in that way. So, but yeah, so you were, you were right that noticed the similarity. Noe, do you have an idea or a comment? hand on my behalf um uh is that like a like the arhat becoming not caring is that is that like they lose the energy to 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 to, to, to become enlightened to achieve <clears throat> unsurpassable enlightenment because <clears throat> they i mean yeah, is it sort of like a cautionary thing? Like, don't do that. Well, they're the from Mahayana the Mahayana Sutras, perspective. Yeah, the Mahayana sutras are always warning against <clears throat> be going down that road. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah. So, I mean, I I want to remind everybody that within that early Buddhist system, the understanding was is that everybody was could could only deal with their own karma. That like there was no you were you had to deal with your karma, I gotta deal with my karma. And so it was a very like self-centered path in that way. And it wasn't self-centered you know, be, as a virtue, it was just self-centered because that was what the work was understood to be. It wasn't about us. It was about me in that way. And so by reaching a state of, of not being emotionally involved in the world at all, that was the goal of early Buddhism, to not be emotionally involved in the world. But what that did was it made us so emotionally uninvolved that we just didn't care about other people <clears throat> in that sense. Yeah, no, yeah, no. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's read a few more because it doesn't end with just the irony or the paradox of an arhat being fully awakened. Uh, let me go back to the Tibet. The Tibet one on this one section is really nice. So, 
when beings in dreams, as well as echoes, mirages, reflections of the moon in water, and emanations of a Tathagata, when those awaken to Buddhahood, at that time I too will fully awaken to Buddhahood. When the sun shines at night and the moon shines during the day, at that time I too shall fully awaken to Buddhahood. Noble one, this being so, why don't you ask someone who aspires to awakening? <laughs> so, characters in dreams becoming awakened. Now, let's take that one right there. And I want to use that one just to kind of um, uh, reiterate what Tanya said. Tanya said something a moment ago about this that was very wise. So, you take that one, for example, about when beings in dreams, right? What does this one say? Yeah, if a dream, if a dream could attain awakening, I would attain awakening. So the idea here is, is that at, when we first hear that and we go, oh yeah, okay. A, a character in a dream is not a real person. And so that they can't attain awakening. Again, that's like Mickey Mouse. Mickey Mouse doesn't exist in that way, is an illusory being. So there's no being to become awakened. Well, this whole sutra, especially all the deeper parts with Manjushri, the message has been about how the self is imaginary, is like a dream character. <laughs> And so the point is, is that Manjushri in that sense, as dream character, never attain awakening, just like Mickey Mouse, just like all of those. So Michael will never attain awakening in that way. Or you could put it uh, that Michael will attain awakening as soon as Mickey Mouse attains awakening. At the exact same day, exact same time, right? So... If you think about it, the logic that way, then this will make a lot of sense. So by the way, that was really, the end of that is really funny, where he, at the end, he basically says, so why are you asking me? You should ask somebody who's seeking enlightenment, because <laughs> I'm not, I'm not doing that, right? And so the, the Bodhisattva says, noble one, or Manjushri, you're not, you don't seek awakening? Like, you're not after awakening? And Manjushri says, no, I do not seek awakening. Why not? Because Manjushri himself is awakening. And awakening is Manjushri. How is that? Noble one. Awakening, Manjushri, these are just words. Such labels are empty, functionless, and emptiness is awakening. So I just read from this version. Manju Shri, right? You don't seek, you're not seeking awakening? Manjushri answers, no, why not? Because Manjushri is none other than enlightenment, and enlightenment is none other than Manjushri. Why is that? Because Manjushri is only an arbitrary name, and so is enlightenment. Furthermore, the name is non-existent, and it cannot act. Therefore, it is empty. The nature of emptiness is none other than enlightenment. So before I go on, I want to just seize that opportunity. Once again, I was trying to make this a good Dharma talk with all of my little different points. 
So the reason why I wanted to, you know, talk a little bit about emptiness ahead of time when we were talking about space and formlessness, and when I wanted to point at how emptiness was this very different idea. It's kind of related to these other ideas, but when we're starting to say that form is emptiness, we realize like, oh, we're we're talking about something else then because space, formlessness, nothingness is is all in relationship to form. So the definition, and I tried to give you tonight a really clear, succinct definition of what is emptiness about? It's about thinking that something is just one thing. And that one thing, you know, like a book. Last time I checked, it these are all pages, and these are all sentences, and these are all words, and those are all letters, and those are all little lines. So it's a but like take your pick, but the point is is that you're gonna choose the one, you know, the book, the one thing. And as I was saying, emptiness is about that, that one thing that doesn't exist. It's just an idea in your conceptualized mind in that way. The reason why I wanted to give you that really as clear as I could definition of, oh, that's emptiness, because emptiness is being equated with awakening in this sutra. Like to understand emptiness is to understand awakening. And then to sort of be, it's, this is where I always struggle with language, but to be in tune with emptiness, to be like, you know, in tune with that idea, M meaning being aware that you're doing that, the objectifying of objects into things and, and understanding then that once we do that, as soon as there is an objectified thing like a book or a cup, as soon as there's the, the objectified thing, well, now we can start with the, and you're a great book. You're a beautiful, wonderful, the best book in the world. And Buddhism is, has always been, that's again, why I wanted to go back to the beginning tonight. Buddhism has always been about the way these things are messing with us. <laughs> These objects are turning our minds about. And so the early Buddhist path was about, yeah, this stuff's crazy. Get into the space. Like, forget about the objects, get into the space. And this whole teaching about emptiness, the reason why it's really so profound is because it achieves the same alleviation of suffering that Buddhism has always been interested in, except it's, it achieves that liberation in a non-dualistic way. The dualistic way was the stuff is over here and it's getting to your mind. So meditate in sensory deprivation until you can get really good at abiding in space. So stuff, space. But this teaching of emptiness is, again, it's, it's about space as a concept and stuff as concepts. It's about all of those as concepts. And so, again, the emptiness is this sort of enlightened wisdom of the Mahayana tradition because it achieves that same goal of not getting attached to things, not getting worked up by things, but in a way that's non-dual. And so we're not going and running and seeking the pure realms of a monastery or the, you know, whatever. We realize, oh, <laughs> the objectifying mind is always at work. It's always at work everywhere in that sense. And so everywhere is a zendo. Everywhere is a place of practice at that, at that moment. Whereas if we're searching, searching for that realm of pure space, 
it, it's going to be tough to find in that way. Like we're going to have to get super calm in that sense. Okay. Any last comments, questions before I wanted to just read the very last part of this. So the last little part of this, and I actually think I might have finished this. Oh no, I've I finished the section. Because we move on to it, we, we move on to a new, uh, not a new sutra, of course, but a new section. Uh, but I just wanted to read that part about this sort of interesting way of thinking about awakening. Manjushri's sort of ko koan-esque answer to the bodhisattva. So, no? Questions, comments, answers, ideas? All right, then we'll call it an early night uh, because the next section is a big one and I don't want to get too into it, so.